time. Welcome into On Texas Football Friday afternoon live stream. Good Friday, everyone. Uh, everybody uh, hanging out with us a little bit today. Texas Relays underway. A couple of visitors on campus I want to get to almost immediately with CJ and uh, Jerry from a recruiting perspective. Uh, but it's a little bit of a free for all Friday today, brought to you by Andy Ludicky and by perfectfranchise.net. Make sure you check him out uh, if you get a chance. Uh, but first, let's get it started with some news and notes. We're also going to be taking your questions. Uh, Jerry, CJ, what's going on in the world of recruiting today? Yeah, we had uh, we had broke the news early in the week that Josiah Sharma from Folsom, uh, high out in Northern California in the Bay Area, north of the Bay Area, he was expected to be on campus uh, this weekend. We said there was a chance it could be pushed back the next weekend, but we thought it was going to be this weekend based on multiple people we had talked with. And that appears to be the case. And um, I think, uh, you know, CJ was out and about around the uh, uh, with the around Texas relays. And I think I think he was just he happened to see Folsom Folsom coaches uh, there as well. So that got confirmed uh, that, you know, Josiah Sharma. And that's a big deal for Texas to get Sharma on campus because, look, he's six, five, 300 pounds, six, four and a half, 300 pounds. He's a one time Washington commitment. He's been on campus at Alabama. Uh, you know, he's got an official visit to Washington in mid-May. He's got Utah June 14th, uh, 14th through 16th. I think Texas will end up being June 21st through 23rd. We'll see after this visit. I think this visit was key because this starts the real part of the process. Kind of like when uh, Brandon Baker came on campus for that spring game, that kind of kick-started the process for Texas. So with Sharma – one of the top D tackles in the country. Rankings be damned. Don't look at the rankings. Just watch the film. He's an elite defensive tackle. Uh, this starts that process. And look, this is Johnny Nansen, guys. Johnny Nansen's recruited Folsom High for years. He knows all the P all coaches on that staff for years. Um, not that Sarkeesian Hatton, uh, not that Texas didn't have some ties already, but that accelerated this process for Texas. Sharma's had discussions with Johnny Nansen and Brandon uh, Kenny Baker since he was offered by uh, uh, Nansen there in January. And now they've got him on campus. And I think this will be followed up with an official visit in June. Uh, J J uh, CJ, can you tell us what you saw? I know you're headed over to the Texas Relays. And uh, give it, give us a little uh, taste of what uh, what you saw. Yeah, I tell you what, the Texas Relays, when it's in town, it's it's a full-on parade and festival in between DKR and uh, the Mike A. Meyer Stadium. A lot going on, very busy. Uh, but, yeah, uh, the Folsom logo, Folsom hat, Folsom shirt, walking around the streets of uh, DKR, heading into the Moncrief facility. Uh, it can only mean one thing, especially with what we expected coming into the weekend. Uh, also, Kobe Sellers, the Shadow yeah. Creek 2025 cornerback, was on campus as well today. Uh, that's an interesting one. Texas is kind of in a Red River shootout battle here with Oklahoma, who feels very confident about where they stand with Kobe Sellers early on. He was on campus again uh, today. Last time he was on campus was in January for the J January 20th Junior Day. So it's kind of double up and get two visits there early in this spring. Uh, very important in that recruitment. Of course, the teammate of current Texas commit Anthony Williams in that defensive side of the ball. Uh, you'll see a lot of athletes coming out of Shadow Creek. And right now, Kobe Sellers is another one uh, to keep an eye on. Uh, Jerry, and you also, said I Sellers, Jerry, you said Sellers was uh, on campus early, early this morning, too. Yeah, Kobe uh, told me uh, via text this morning, right before we went on coffee and football, he actually got the campus shortly after 6 a.m. He wanted to go through the whole process of Texas – the meeting room and everything before they hit the practice field at nine. So he got the uh, he got the full meal deal this morning. Got up early, uh, kind of took in everything Texas does uh, at a spring practice, from uh, when the guys get there to the meeting, and, and then prepping up for the spring practice, position meetings and whatnot. So he got a great look at it. Um, he'll be at A and M June seventh through 9th for an official Texas the fourteenth through sixteenth, and Oklahoma the twenty first through twenty third. He'll also be at the Oklahoma spring game. Uh, April 20th. So I, I do think Oklahoma has been trending there for a while. Texas is going to make it a fight uh, for sure. And, and we'll see which way that goes long term. But it does tell you uh, how much the sellers is coveted by Texas that they're making this big of a push because there aren't many guys on campus right now. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a couple of younger prospects on campus. Uh, but a reminder, I mean, DeCorian Moore's playing with the hearts of Texas fans today. He's on Instagram 
checking in at the University of Texas. Obviously, he's at the Texas Relays, and he has to. Fin- he would have to finish up competition before he could come over to Texas. But the key with the Corey and Moore guys is he's going to be there for the spring game April 20th. I actually checked in with Keelan Russell to see if he made his way to Austin and maybe watch the team, Duncanville relay team. He said he's not in Austin. So I think April 20th is going to be the visit date for uh, the Corey and Moore at Texas around that spring game. Not to say that he can't stop in after he's done and say hello, uh, but we're leaning more to April 20th for the key visit. All right, there's one other name on campus I wanted to mention real quick, Bobby, if you don't mind. Uh, 2027 quarterback out of Waxahachie, Jerry Meyer III, is on campus today. Uh, certainly one to keep an eye on. Set the, the Nevada State record last year for with, with touchdowns in a season. He had 58, so the kid knows how to play a little bit of ball. Uh, won the two-way state classification championship last, last year as well. Just transferred to the DFW area. Will be at Oklahoma on April April 6th, and we'll be visiting Texas A&M April 20th. Right now uh, on campus today in Austin, taking in the, the early morning practice and hanging around the facilities a little bit as well. And so, one of the top 27, 2027 running backs in America out of Jackson, Alabama, uh, is on campus as well, uh, CJ. Uh, he's a guy that has offers from Alabama, Auburn, Texas off for January 31st. I mean, he is one of the top 27 prospects in America. He's on campus today. That's a long ways out. That's a long way away, but that won't be his last visit well, to Texas. Let me ask you this. I want to go back to this Jerry Meyer the third you mentioned. Um, so he he's he was originally from the state of Nevada, but moved yes. to the Metroplex this offseason. And he was the state player of the year, 58 touchdown passes last year in Nevada, and now he's transferred to Waxahachie. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep. And uh very interesting. You know, he's not the largest guy, but one thing that's really interesting is. He's got 10 and a half inch hands already as a, as a freshman in high school. So uh, really encouraging for the sense that quarterbacks, you know, one of those uh, measurements that, you know, NFL scouts and, and, and prospectus, uh, you know, coaches look for is the hand size at the quarterback position. Uh, and it, it kind of shows when you watch the tape, you know, he's, he, he, he scrambles in a way that is always looking downfield which I don't think you can teach very often at that young of an age. Uh, really encouraging in the sense that he kind of has that gamesmanship already uh, in his game this early. So, yeah, uh, a really talented player. Again, 58 touchdowns a year ago leading his team to a state championship. It's pretty good. Yep. All right, uh, we're going to get to y'all's questions today. It's going to be a free-for-all. Whatever y'all want to talk about today, we're here for it. The Longhorns had their sixth practice of the, uh, camp, of the spring uh, practice schedule. Uh, it was not available or open to media, so we're still working behind the scenes to find out some of the things that took place. They were on the field at uh, Denius Fields, my understanding, at uh, 9 a.m. this morning. Uh, but for now, I want to say thank you to our sponsor. Each and every Friday's live stream uh, brought to you by our friend Andy Ludicky at MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you're looking to leave the corporate rat race, be a business owner of your own. Uh, get with Andy. He knows the franchise game better than anybody else inside and out. 404-973-9901 or Andy at MyPerfectFranchise.net. He has a system that takes you through and identifies which franchise ownership opportunities are best for you. Uh, I really think you'll enjoy it and going through the process. He's, uh, he's met with and dealt with and placed dozens of people with their own businesses through the years. That's Andy at MyPerfectFranchise.net. Big Longhorn fan. Uh, as well. Jerry, I, I, I'm going to answer our one basketball question E. Kim answered. Well, we have another basketball update, which we'll get to later in the show. But E. Kim asked, is Illinois going to take down Connecticut? I wouldn't bet on that. But the key question is, can anybody get it inside 10 against Connecticut? Because they have seven NCAA tournaments in a row by double digits. So, And they Crazy. actually, I mean, they're, they're playing at a extremely high level. But that doesn't mean you can't get beat. It's the NCAA tournament. Um, but uh, it'll be interesting. The uh, the, the another lead eight game that's very fascinating to me is Alabama Clemson. I don't know if uh, Nick Saban and uh, and Dabo are going to get together and, and and throw Dukes before that game, but uh, Clemson is uh, Br- Br- Coach Brownell is one of the best in the country. Just tremendous. Hey, just another argument for the expanded playoff. Getting these guys in the round of eight, right? You know, you don't want to see them in the state or in the national title. Hey, I'm I'm happy for Bobby Hurley because I used to enjoy watching him uh, play basketball. He was one of those scrappy guys. Had a bunch of uh, kind of, I don't want to say prima donnas, but uh, pretty boys around him, Christian Leitner, Grant Hill. He was kind of the scrappy one of the group, right? Uh, all right, hey, a uh, couple other questions here that we're going to 
take and let's get started with it. What about Alex January and Sadir Mitchell? Uh, two young guys. Are they going to split reps during the spring game at the nose tackle position? I'll, I'll just be honest. I'll, I'll take this and start. Yesterday, or excuse me, Wednesday, when I was at practice, Alex January had already moved in front of Sadir Mitchell in the rotation uh, to give you an idea of where that's at. Now, I will say, uh, and I mentioned this multiple times now, Sadir Mitchell looked a little bouncier than he had the first practice I saw. him. So he looked like he was starting to get his, his legs underneath him a little bit. And Sadir Mitchell, if you get a chance to see him, you understand he's a bonus size guy. The question is whether or not he gets, um, you know, whether he can take more than 10 to 15 snaps a game and actually be a force, or is he going to be relegated to just a minor role player because of his uh, conditioning? Uh, Alex January looks like uh, looks really, really good right now. He's got a ways to go because he needs good weight. He needs more muscle. You know, he, he's just a couple years away from also playing baseball. So he hasn't even just right. totally focused on football very long. Uh, so really, we're talking about that sort of stuff. Uh, it's to me one of those situations where you kind of have to wait and see where it plays out. Right now, ideally, I'm not sure any either of them would play more than 10 to 15 snaps a game. That's ideally. Doesn't mean that won't be what happens based on uh, whether or not they get somebody out of the portal or not. All right, let's, I, I, uh, I like Alex January. What's that? I, I, I like what I've heard so far about Alex January. He's given, you know, and I think this is something that's encouraging so far as the youngsters on campus going against one another and kind of, uh, you know, getting, you know, duking it out early on in their Texas career. Uh, Daniel Cruz and Alex January, I've heard, have gone back and forth when they go one-on-one -on -one against each other. Now that pads are on, uh, th those two give each other uh, the work. And I, I, I really enjoy hearing that. You'll hear about it more in the seven-on-seven, seven, the individual, you know, one-on-one -on -one route kind of combinations with the, the wide receivers and the, the DBs, but early on, a, a, a pair of guys on the interior that are making noise, Alex January and Daniel Cruz. Yep, good stuff. All right, uh, let's take a few more questions here. If you're joining us on uh, YouTube, podcast, Twitter, wherever, make sure you uh, sign up for our podcast on Apple or Megaphone, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast, you'll get automatically downloaded uh, each and every episode. Or if you're on YouTube, please hit that subscribe and like button so you're notified each and every time uh, we come on the air. Again, that's YouTube. All you have to do is put the subscribe button or on podcast. Uh, all you have to do is subscribe as well. Of course, it's all free uh, here at On Texas Football. Uh, all right, next question here. This one from King Me, who has been a pleasant surprise this spring. I'm going to, we'll, we'll all three answer this question because it's kind of fun one. Jerry, you start us off. Um, you know, the obvious answer is going to be Neto for me so far because he had had such a good last three weeks of practice of the season 2023. He set himself up to challenge and push in the spring, which he had not truly done until the last three weeks of the of, of practice in 2023. So the fact that he is now making that push at left guard and he's been with the ones a couple of practices, uh, uh, earlier in the week, uh, that's saying something for his continued consistency, whether that's in meeting room and or practice field. So uh, that's a pleasant surprise because one of the things for me is when you hear somebody does well at the end of the season, you want to hear that carry over. Uh, and so that and these guys develop on their own timelines. I mean, Kelvin Banks was different than DJ Campbell was different than Neto was different than Cam Williams, right? So uh, the fact that Neto is stringing this together from end of the season, headed into the spring here, and starting the spring, uh, that's positive for Texas. Because, again, like we talked about, in, five years, six years ago, you couldn't even entertain the thought of having of moving Hayden Connor around and cross-training him at different positions. Couldn't do it. CJ, who do you got for surprise in the spring thus far, bud? Yeah, I, I've got one. The early one was uh, Matthew Golden, just seeing what he looked like in person, how smooth he was, being able to catch, you know, the front half of the football. And, you know, obviously, Quince said it himself. He has pretty soft hands when the ball is in his area. I think that will translate in contested catches when he's in traffic. Uh, drops were an issue a little bit last year. But, hey, what I'm seeing right now is a guy that's completely focused, a guy that's bought in. You see the routes, uh, Bobby. We watched him on Wednesday. Uh, he, he's kind of got that extra extra gear to him, I think. And 
Uh, it just looks smooth all the way around. That's a guy that I think gets it and he understands it. Having played two years of college already, uh, this system, as he gets more and more comfortable with it, I think you'll start hearing his name uh, uh, you know, all the more as the spring continues. You know, what's interesting to me, CJ, I agree with you a little bit about Matthew Golden, but I wouldn't have picked him after the first practice. But after the fifth practice, when we saw him again, I would agree mm -hmm. with him. He, yeah. he, you know, he's, look, it's a new system for him. Uh, a lot of what he did at Houston translates, obviously, with Dana, Dana Holgerson and his high-flying attack. Uh, but I felt like he was a little quiet day one, and I thought he was a little more assertive day five. Not, not surprising, right? But, again, it's just not instant. It's not just turn on the – the spigot, and all of a sudden it's over. Um, uh, so that that would be one. Uh, my surprise, uh, and you know, sorry if this is a you know broken record, is Trey Moore. I mean, I was hearing great things about him about two weeks prior to spring ball starting, and then I watched practice. The first day I didn't see him as much. On Wednesday, I went and kind of really tried to pay attention to the edge, defensive tackle, linebacker group. Trey Moore is going to be a player for Texas. Um, I, I said that this morning. I think if I underrated anybody coming out of this portal class and somehow you underrate a guy with 14 and a half sacks, that's on me. You know, <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel dumb for doing that, but I like him. I like him a lot and I like what he's doing overall. It's really, really uh, strong right now. So I would I would add him. There are going to be others. I think others need to be in contention too. DeAndre Moore. Uh, we can hear positive things about him behind the scenes, right, CJ? Yeah. Yeah, he's absolutely a guy. You know, we watched it, you know, day one. Him showing up about 30 minutes prior to practice beginning, getting that extra work on the field. Again, this is a guy that didn't have any receptions a year ago, left home to come to Texas, and is probably sitting here, you know, in Austin by himself during the offseason thinking, I really got to show my friends, my family, and everybody that was in my corner back home why I came to Texas. So he had that chip on his shoulder a little bit. Uh, he's put in the work, and right now running with that first team in the slot, he's getting his looks, and he's looking pretty good in him. Yeah, I, I love it. I love a guy that doesn't want to – that's going to fight for his place. Yeah. That's, and that's DeAndre Moore, and he has talent. It's not like he's talentless. No. If you're willing to put those two things together, even if it's – Hey, if it's not even at Texas someday, DeAndre Moore, you're the kind of guy that is going to get the most out of himself, and I'm really, really impressed by that. What were you going to say, Jerry? No, I, and I think the thing, too, is the great thing at the wide receiver position for Sark, we have talked about this before, is with the younger guys, look, the one thing you know is, okay, the portal is going to be very attractive for a receiver coming to Texas, right? Especially after what A.D. Mitchell did last year, coming from Georgia to Texas. Yeah, he wasn't healthy at Georgia, but he still had his best year on the field other than putting on a ring at the end. Uh, but you, Tess, Sark's in such a great spot, Chris Jackson, because you're going to see who has patience and, and believes in process. Because you do have to have some patience um, and you do have to believe in the process. So that is what this spring is going to show uh, Sarkeesian and Chris Jackson about some of those young, younger receivers. Who's going to get frustrated and talk about hitting the door or who's going to trust in the process, trust in the program that Sark's built and trust in their development. And that's a hard thing to do nowadays because the easiest thing to do is to hit the road and go get immediate impact playing time where it's not even question whether you're going to be that guy but that puts texas in a great spot at all positions the blue bloods i think it puts blue blood programs in a great spot because they're going to have big time guys out of the portal come to their program so those younger guys that are in the developmental process you see who's really bought in to development and process versus instant gratification it's a good place uh, to be for blue blood so i know people that are watching this on youtube can tell that see that I'm Bobby Burton. I'm joined by CJ Vogel and Jerry Hamilton. Uh, a lot of people listening to us on podcast as well as on Twitter. Uh, guys, uh, I want to reintroduce us. I'm Bobby Burton, Jerry Hamilton on the bottom of the screen, CJ Vogel up top. Jerry, I'm going to stay with you on this question from Burt Orange Horn. Uh, let's go. Seems like a lot of possible 2025 QB stand-ins want to be noticed by Sarkeesian. I think KJ Carl Lacey is solidly pledged to Sarkeesian. Do you think that's a fair 
assessment maybe of where they're at in, in recruiting from a, a quarterback stand, standpoint? Because Lacey is already solidly pledged, Jerry, and you've said he doesn't have any other visits set up to any other schools at this time. And he has three visits, Kevin, up to Texas, uh, April 6th, April 20th, and June 21st through 23rd. Look, uh, that's not going to keep Ole Miss, Auburn, uh, maybe Oregon, but really it's the schools in the Southeast in, in the SEC Conference. It's not going to keep those schools from coming after him. But to, to the burn orange horns point, uh, I don't I don't think anything's changed. After Texas beat Bama last year and followed it up with a really good season, which obviously almost a great season, but getting to the college football playoff, they have the ability, they have more eyes on the program than ever before or since the uh, really heyday of the Mac Brown era. And I say ever before because social media has changed the game in recruiting. So Texas, this is the most eyes they've ever had on the program in recruiting. So you have the ability to get as a lot more kids on campus and continue that evaluation process. So, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of offensive players looking at Texas right now, whether that's quarterback, whether that's running back, whether that's wide receiver. It, it, they saw what Texas did. They see where the program's heading. It's just not the kids. It's the people around them. It's the champions of the recruitment. It's the high school coaches, seven-on-seven seven coaches, what have you. Um, and Texas is also strong in the NIL game. So I, I do think Texas has more eyes on them than ever, and I do think they have more interest in the program than they've ever had. Uh, and they should because it's been it's the most they've won at the highest level since really social media took off and, and was a difference maker in recruiting. Fair enough. I think that's true. Since 2009, I mean, Twitter wasn't a huge thing back then. I mean, TikTok did not exist. You know, I mean, there's all these things. Jerry, I, I want to go back, though. The 2025 QB stand-ins comment, I, I think that's a little trite, you know, to say that and kind of denigrate to the guys that are – but Keelan Russell is one of them, young man out of uh, Duncanville that does is he's not a stand-in for anybody. Who are some of the others that you've heard? Like there was a guy out of California, right? At Orange Lutheran, I think, that was it was a possibility. Who, who are the guys that are the there, there's the, the name TJ Latif out there? But I mean, really, look, Keelan Russell's the other guy. Um, he's okay. the guy that's coming out for the spring game April 20th. He's one of the best friends of the Corey and Moore. He's at Duncanville. Um, he's a guy who's just gotten better and better each year. He's the best quarterback Duncanville's had. Uh, Jaquindon Jackson was a athlete playing quarterback. Keelan Russell is easily the best quarterback I've seen Duncanville have in my two decades in this business. So uh, legitimate power five quarterback, not a guy you wonder what position he's going to play. Keelan Russell's a quarterback with quarterback instincts uh, and, and a really good feel for the position. Uh, saw it last spring, saw it this year. So he's really the one. TJ Latif is another name. Uh, but I I don't think things are getting outside of KJ Lacey and Keelan Russell. Got it. I, I don't either. Uh, I, I just don't – I don't know if it's really going to get outside of KJ Lacey. That, that's – I know they're tinkering with Keelan Russell, but, but is it really – are they really going to go there? Are they really thinking about a two-quarterback class? I can't believe – that, that that's necessarily where, where Steve Sarkeesian wants to go, given that if he does that, then what happens with your 2026 quarterback group? And he's done so well, Jerry and CJ, yeah. of splicing this up into one a year. He really has, right? And then you could end up having a situation where you have two quarterbacks come in, like Texas did with Cam Rising and Casey Thompson, and eventually both of them bolt, and then you didn't have another one behind that. Right. And so you really kind of get lost uh, in that that scenario. And I don't think that's what Texas wants uh, at all at quarterback. All right. Let's move on here to another question. This one from Kemet King. Uh, any news on Kendrick Blackshire? He gives me that throwback uh, linebacker feel that I like. CJ, what do you think? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, he certainly looks the part of a guy that you would look at as a, a, a Ray Lewis or, you know, one of those big middle linebackers that brought the pain back in the day. Uh, the issue is the game's kind of evolved, and now you have to be able to drop back in coverage. You kind of, you know, the linebackers that you see have a lot of success are, you know, a little bit slender, are the guys that can move very well, like at the Marvion Overshone uh, that we saw last year or two years ago, Jalen Ford over the past two seasons as well. You know, I think right now, uh, Sarkeesian even mentioned it. Blackshear is a little overweight at 262. I think they want to get him around 250 uh, by the time the season comes around. It just helps in space. And I think that's the biggest part. Yes, you're going to the SEC. Yes, you're going to be dealing with faster humans, bigger, stronger, whatever it might be. 
but you also have to play the game in which it's evolved into, and that's the passing game. Uh, Blackshears looked good in in shorts and shirts. <laughs> you know, we knew that out of high school. This was, you know, one of those genetic freaks that you see walking down the street, and you go, "Holy cow! This guy was made in a lab." You know, he certainly has has that part going for him. Uh, the question is, can he? prove himself to be a guy that you see consistently in the past game and play all three downs for the Longhorns. Uh, right now, the two guys, two guys that you see in the middle of the, uh, the Texas defense, Anthony Hill, obviously David Benda is his counterpart right now. Mo Blackwell, a guy that's gotten some first team reps at Sam is getting a couple looks on the interior as well, right next to Benda. So something to keep an eye on is Texas. Again, we've talked about positionless and versatility this offseason a lot. Linebackers, another spot where they're making sure that they cross train enough pieces that if one guy goes down, it's a seamless transition to the next, or it frees up a guy like Anthony Hill to move around the defense and creative, creatively, uh, you know, impact the game in other facets of uh, the the scheme and and game plan. Uh, and uh, we can we can guys we can go through the games where uh, you know look the great thing the thing that makes teams really really good is versatility. Um, and some of that versatility, we're, most often it's talked about on offense, but defensive versatility is key. Uh, a guy like Kendrick Blacks already played 100 snaps in the box for Alabama last year. Playoff team, right? Michigan, Kentucky, name the games, Georgia. There's a place for a Kendrick Blackshire, and that's part of being a versatile team as a whole defensively. I, Kendrick Blackshire, I don't, he wasn't taken to be a 500 snap guy for Texas. Right. He was taken to be part of a defense that has the parts to go up against any type of offense they see. So you're going to see Kendrick Blackshire in Ann Arbor because Michigan's going to try to run the ball right at you, especially early second game of the year with a new quarterback, right? You know Georgia's going to say, all right, here we come. What are you going to do about it in that game? So you can – Kentucky's going to try to do the same thing, which is why they're a bad matchup for Georgia, and Georgia holds them to 165 yards. But there's, there's four or five games on this schedule where you know teams – we're going to try to attack Texas with a downhill run game up the middle. Kendrick Blackshire's got a he, he's got a place at Texas in that regard. I got to say this. Uh, so everybody knows David Benda is one of the more rocked up uh, linebackers for the University of Texas. Uh, Kendrick Blackshire takes that to a different level. Yeah. You're, if you're if you haven't seen him in person, he is a different level of rock, rocked up than than uh, than David Benda really is. He. Somebody, Rod was saying, we used to call our Anthony Wheeler went affectionately known as prison. By, by Charlie Strong, by the by, way. By Charlie Strong, because he looked like he was built like he just came out of a prison and spent a bunch of time lifting weights, et cetera. That's Kendrick Blackshire plus a little. Yeah. I mean, Kendrick Blackshire is a, is a good looking dude from that perspective. All right. Uh, let's say thank you to our sponsors real quick, if you don't mind. Uh, first, we want to say thank you to Autograph. Uh, big news, Longhorn fans. We're excited to be working with Autograph, co-founded by the GOAT himself, Tom Brady. Autograph is where real Texas fans get unreal rewards. It's the first app to track and reward fans for loving what they love most, turning passion into access and experiences. Founded on the belief that devotion should be rewarded and the future of fandom belongs to the fans, They've been sending true fans to the biggest games in college basketball for just $16. Yes, 16 bucks. As we gear up for football season, that means you can score uh, discounted tickets to marquee matchups, uh, scan to download the free autograph app in the Apple Store, and use a referral code on Texas. That's referral code on Texas, and see where fandom takes you. See where fandom takes you. Thank you uh, to Autograph and their uh, sponsorship and partnership with On Texas Football. Also want to say thank you uh, to our friends at Flat Creek Winery. Uh, Flat Creek Winery is just a, it's, it's an award-winning winery. Five awards in Houston, or excuse me, in San Francisco. Got double gold at the Houston Rodeo, Livestock Show and Rodeo Show, including the Grand Reserve and Reserve categories as well. Uh, they are just outside of Austin. It's a locally owned uh, winery that competes with the very best in the nation. Flat Creek is your place uh, to hang out, buy a bottle of wine. They're now available at Specs. Uh, this week, they have a big thing going on out there. It's an actual, or absolutely beautiful property. If you get a chance to see it, you'll know what I mean. 
Uh, you can go out there for an Easter egg hunt with your kids, take your wife out to dinner, uh, whatever you may like to do. Uh, Flat Creek has it out there for you. And it's made right here in Austin. They blend old world tradition with new world techniques to deliver you a wine experience you never thought possible. possible. You're ready for a better wine. So head down to Specs or visit flatcreekestate.com to get your first taste of Flat Creek wines. All right, thank you for your sponsorship and partnership uh, with those two. All right, here we go. We got some more questions here. This one is a good one. To stop. Yeah, good one. Uh, Ryan Nelson, and this goes back to the quarterback conversation we were just having, guys. A.J. Milwee is the good cop recruiting type. Sark is the brain of the QB development. Milwee, after he secures the QB, QB commit, he goes on fa- vacation. Stark stays in the lab, different skill sets. I don't know if I believe I, if I agree that right. with that, but I understand where you're trying to go. Yeah, so I I think look, AJ Milwe, um, I, I think he's got he's got a natural feel for recruiting quarterbacks, is one thing I want to say. Uh he was big in the arch uh recruitment on the day-to-day basis. And that's, you know, that's actually a lot of pressure, by the way. You want to step into your first major recruitment, and there he is. Um, uh, And he did a great job with that. So I I think on a day-to-day basis, recruiting quarterbacks, uh, he does a good job. I mean, look, if you talk to K.J. Lacey, who has he talked with the most during his recruitment? It's A.J. Milwee, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. Now, a lot of those messages are coming from Steve Sarkeesian as well. Correct. I mean, and then they get on a Zoom call together, or get on the phone together, or whatnot. Uh, but AJ Milway has got he has got the day to day recruiting uh, of the quarterback position. And look, here's the reality: this spring and the spring evaluation period, it's going to be AJ Milway going out to see these guys, shooting the video, and reporting back to Sark. So his his job is extremely extremely uh, important for Texas. Uh, so somebody, somebody asked real quick. But they've had a few questions, Bobby. Basketball, early portal names to keep an eye on. Look, look at the bigs. I mean, Brandon Garrison's a guy that Texas finished top three coming out of a high school on. They really like what he could be as a wall-up defender, broad shoulder, rim protector, rebounder. You're really going to be looking for guys like that. Texas has had a conversation with Andre Stoyakovich. Where it's going to go, I don't know. The first go-round, it ended up being staying on the West Coast. Um, but uh, Rodney Terry was the point man in that recruitment out of high school with Stoyakovich. Texas finished second on, on that one. So I will that one go Texas way? I think something would have to shift a little bit from the first go round, the thinking from the mom side of that recruitment. They've been in touch with them, but Texas is going to look point guard. Obviously, there's some talk out there about A.J. Store uh, out of Wisconsin, who's also in the NBA draft, which obviously is his number one choice, uh, but six seven uh, wing, uh, college wing guard. Uh, what well, point guard's going to be a need, um, and uh, two bigs is going to be a need, and a wing player that can shoot it's going to be a need. But one of those bigs has to be able to shoot the basketball. Hey, Brandon Harrison, that's the guy out of uh, Oklahoma State, right? Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. All right, uh, let's go to a different question, and this one from Mav12. I played against Vernon Broughton in high school. What do y'all think he needs to do this year to maximize his potential? I bet we have different answers on this. I was, so. I was, Mine is simply anchoring against the run better. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, he is, he's a, he's got a little bit of a top heavy body type, if that makes sense, which doesn't pretend well or naturally lend itself to being a good anchor against the run. Um, so really that's my biggest piece for him is not, I like his upfield rush. I wish he was a little more disruptive at times, but really his weakness is that, is that anchoring against the run. Uh, CJ or you or Jerry, either one have something to say? To I was going to say for him to maximize his season at Texas, it's as a disruptor. Because to your point, he's that's he's never you can't force him to be something he's not going to be. So well, for for Vernon to maximize his potential at Texas, those disruptive plays have to be more finishing plays. If he does that this year, I think he'll have maximized what he can do at Texas. Because again. Uh, being an anchor in the run is not what he's ever going to be. That's just not what he is. Uh, there's guys who anchor in the run. They're never going to be pass rush or disruptive guys. So I, I think that's for him to maximize this season. It's finishing those disruptive plays. If he does that at a higher clip, then he's going to have a really good year playing to his strengths. 
Yeah, the thing that stands out to me about Vernon is just the he, he's very active. He has a very high energy, high motor kind of guy, uh, which is good. You want that on the interior of the defensive line, but you also need a guy that's, you know, a, a big physical presence that can move bodies or prevent being moved. And right now, I think because he's so active, it kind of works against him in ways uh, that creates running lanes. I think that's also an issue a little bit for Alfred Collins, uh, a guy that's so hyper athletic that it kind of works against him in the run game. Uh, when running lanes cr are created as a result of where he was previously, uh, it's something that you can certainly work on. And at 320 pounds, you know, it, it can certainly become a strength. It's just not naturally something that they've had in their bag because of how athletic they are and how eager they are to get into the backfield. Uh, by, by the way, another uh, visitor on campus today, uh, JV on Martin, 2026 tight end out of Pflugerville High down the road. Uh, one one of the top tight ends in Texas in 2026 is on campus today. Interesting. Uh, good stuff, Jerry, there. All right. Hey, this one's a, a little bit of a breaking news. Just read from Juju Juice, just read that Michigan is hiring the Memphis defensive line coach. Yes, he is the Michigan, the Memphis defensive line coach, but I got to be honest, he didn't even spend more than a half a semester at Memphis. He actually was the Western Michigan defensive coordinator last year. He is almost a lifelong Michigan guy. He's also been at Ferris State, at Western Michigan. Uh, you know, he's been nearby in St. Joseph's, Indiana. Uh, his name is Lou Esposito. Not exactly a big name hire for the Wolverines. And, of course, we're mentioning this because why is this important? Well, to be fair, I mean, Texas may very well uh, put its head uh, hat in the ring uh, for uh, two defensive tackles at Michigan if they were to go into the portal, uh, Kenneth Grant and uh, Mason Graham, both uh, among the top defensive tackles in the entire country. And, of course, Michigan going through defensive tackle coaches uh, fairly regularly right now. Not only did they lose uh, the last, their first one uh, to the uh, L.A. Chargers when Jim, Jim uh, Harbaugh left, but they also lost the most recent one to a DUI charge. So now Grant and Graham are both going through their third defensive line coach in almost as many months. Uh, so keep that in mind if you're wondering why we're even talking about that at this point in time. All right, uh, welcome in again. If you're just now joining us, we've gained several hundred people in the last 15 minutes here. Uh, my name is Bobby Burton, joined by Jerry Hamilton and CJ Vogel. Uh, the Friday afternoon live stream brought to you by MyPerfectFranchise.net. Give them a call if you're looking to own your own business. Want to go to this call or this question from Ryan Nelson. I'm talking about the wide receiver group, Jerry and CJ. Khalid Lockett out of the Dallas area, Kelshawn Johnson out of Hitchcock down in Houston. Then take your shot at the Decor at Decorian Moore out of Duncanville. NIL is the key in this re recruitment. Go to the portal if you don't get more. Does that sound right to you? I mean, we're hearing, I, I've personally heard that the, that the uh, wide receiver out of Lancaster is high up on the Texas board potentially as well, Emmanuel Choice, but they may not be getting very far on that recruitment. What are you all hearing, either one of you guys? Yeah, so I think there's uh, some wild card recruitments out there. We've had some other discussion uh, questions about the Corey and more like putting asking to put percentages on. I'm not going to be at that point yet. I, I do think the Corey and more ends up at Texas or LSU ultimately. I know uh, Oregon and Ohio State, some others are making a run there. Uh, but we'll, we'll see where it goes. There's a lot of ties to Austin, ties to the University of Texas with the Corey Moore. We'll see we'll do, where this shakes out. Uh, but so there's some wild card recruitments in there. Jamie French out of Jacksonville Mandarin is a guy obviously Texas wants badly. He's coming in April 6th next weekend, uh, which we'll have more on that visit weekend at ontexasfootball.com here uh, later this afternoon and Saturday. Um, but look, Jamie French, Ohio State. Florida State, Miami. I mean, you're in a national recruitment in Jacksonville High at a high school that Texas has never recruited before. Uh, so there's some wild card recruitments out there. Kalik Lockett, I, I, I would say, is a guy that Texas should feel pretty good about right now. But again, uh, making those visits, uh, Penn State, Ohio State, USC, LSU, you kind of name it, A&M. Uh, everybody's trying on Kalik Lockett. Uh, so I think they have, when you recruit this many guys, right, you feel maybe good about one guy in lock and you hope to pull another one uh, too. The question is, is it, is it a true three-man uh, wide receiver class? Uh, 
Uh, Kelshawn Johnson coming in June 14th through 16th, as is Andrew Marsh, who was on campus Monday for uh, uh, for spring practice. I think Kelshawn Johnson uh, has the speed factor. He fits what Texas is recruiting, uh, has recruited at wide receiver under Sark traditionally. We'll see how the numbers shake out in that class. I think a lot is still to be decided. How did these uh, April 6th, how does Texas really feel about Jamie French after April 6th? Where are they at in that race? I think these uh, April visits are going to be huge as far as how these boards can shift and change, how things really change. It, it's not just the talent board. It's the everything around it board. What are our realistic chances board? Yeah, I, 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 I think it's it's a, to your point, and I think CJ is going to say the same, same thing. How is this all going to play out? We don't even know yet. They haven't made official visits. And Sark, guys, Sark is that guy that wants to meet everybody in person and kind of see how they all fit together. Yes. He's not trying to just jam, you know, a, a round peg into a square hole. He's not collecting talent. He's still assembling a team, and which is, to me, is always the key in recruiting, especially at that blue blood level. It's one. It looks great to have number one, two, three classes all the time, but. You have to assemble a team, not just collect talent. And 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 I think that's the toughest thing for Texas moving forward, guys, is once you've kind of elevated and ascended as a program and you have more kids interested and you have more kids wanting to visit, those next two or three classes are the key to continue on with your culture. Uh, Why well, I say that's an overused term, it does have meaning. And continue on with your culture and assembling the best team you can Versus just collecting the best talent you can, because especially in the NIL day and age, guys, there's some guys that are just going for one reason, and it's not always about football. So you got to guard against it. CJ, what what do you have to say, buddy? Uh, it was interesting talking to KJ Lacey last weekend at the Elite Eleven in Austin Westlake High School. Uh, just who he was looking to recruit now that he, you know, obviously uh, firmly committed in this class, looking to get some big time playmakers outside of him as well, kind of joining the class, guys that he'll be throwing the football to. You know, it was Jamie French out of Jacksonville. It was a Khalid Lockett, and it was DeCorian Moore. He mentioned those three guys as the three that he's really going to work on to get into this class. Uh, again, that April 6th visit weekend is going to be big because uh, along with Jamie French and along with Khalid Lockett, Kelshawn Johnson will be there uh, in person. That'll be the first time that he'll be able to meet, meet him, kind of sit down, create that relationship. Of course, Texas is very heavily involved there. The two other guys I wanted to mention at wide receiver because I think it's you know very interesting to me with where Texas is going at the position. The first is Andrew Marsh, who visited Monday, was on campus uh, to take in the spring practice. Again, he's got an official visit coming up June 14th. Uh, a guy out of Houston that is really talented. I've seen him on the 7-7 seven seven, uh, stage a number of times. A uh, good playmaker. Where he stands in this fold right now for Texas recruiting, uh, we'll see. Uh, right now, of course, you look at the names we've mentioned earlier. It, to me, feels like a, a notch above where Marsh is at the moment on the board. The other is uh, Dalen McCutcheon out of Lovejoy. Right now, Texas probably running third here behind Ohio State and Florida State. Uh, Nor Norvell and Ryan Day made back-to-back -back trips to Lovejoy in the winter and uh, really made you know a strong impression on Dalen McCutcheon. Right now, those are the two schools to keep a close eye on. But again, coming in uh, in, in June 14th, coming in uh, for his official visit, another guy to keep a close eye on because, again, very talented, visited last July, last time he was on campus. All right. I got Hey, guys, I got to tell you all this. Uh, we started this YouTube channel about a year and a half ago, I think. Um, we are currently eight subscribers away from 40,000 YouTube subscribers. Come on. Uh, so thank you all to everyone for joining us, whether it's on YouTube, on podcast, uh, or on Twitter, wherever you join us. Thank you uh, for making this all possible. Uh, we want to go next to another question. Uh, this yeah, was, I, I want to follow up real quick, Bobby. Uh, Antoine asked about Adrian Wilson from Fuller Group. Well, I, I'd be very, very surprised on that. I'll yep. say that. Okay. Oh, you're talking about as a wide receiver. I got you. All right. Hey, I want to get to this one because uh, I know CJ may have something for us. Uh, David Rawls asked, any news from this morning's practice? CJ, lay it on us. Yeah, I just got word as we were going live earlier to, about 20 minutes ago. Uh, Malik Murphy, or sorry, Malik Muhammad back <laughs> on the camp <laughs> on the practice field. Whoa, CJ. Whoa. Yeah, Malik yeah, yeah. Murphy, I don't know. The bad bad info there, there, CJ. <laughs> How about this? Manny Muhammad back on the practice field today. 
uh, the, this week he, uh, you know, went through the stretching line, but departed for the training room uh, quickly after the stretching line, uh, you know, concluded and the guys went into individual drills. Today he was back on the practice field, uh, getting back to the, you know, the, the runs of college or spring football today uh, was not with the first group. I will add uh, he is working himself back to hundred percent. I think that will take time, but he is again, going to be your starting cornerback. It was Gavin Holmes again with that first unit uh, opposite of Terrence Brooks. That's interesting that he, at least it, it is what we think it is a tweaked hamstring. If that's mm-hmm. the case, right. Uh, because that's what we, that's what kind of what Sark intimated. He didn't come out and say it, but you know what? There's no reason zero reason for him to have to go out there. And if he's got a tweaked hamstring to try to stretch it um, the second week of spring ball, because you, you kind of already know what he can do and know the trajectories on uh, keep him healthy as much as humanly possible. In, in my, I, I, we've had a couple of people jokingly ask if I have a manscape read today and I don't, but guys I always have it near me. Oh, good. <laughs> Jerry. Hey, this one's a good one. Good question here. I think from eight, eight, one, seven, Mr. Talk too much. I'm more concerned about this portal window, window, not from what we gain, but from what we lose. What do you think of that? Like, is this one of those years where Texas is now situated in a position that there's more to lose at times than there is to gain? I am not there yet. I think it's going to be 50-50. I do think they're going to be five, six, seven, eight guys leave at mid year here after spring ball because they're they're behind other people they may be good players by the way right but, but they're behind other people but i still think texas is situated enough where they can they can reap more than than uh they lose out of this y'all y'all agree with that i i don't think texas is going to lose anybody that's going to impact their 24 season that's what i'll say see i i kind of have the opposite and maybe not to the point where, you know, this was a guy that was playing every down, but a, a contributor nonetheless. I think this is the first time where you'll see guys who are probably going to be starters on special teams or a guy that you would see rotationally on the field this year maybe depart. And it's because there's so much talent and there's so much depth around the field right now. I think right now what you're seeing is some of the older guys who – maybe carved out a little bit of a role last year, expecting to be in that same or increased role, kind of hear back that they're not ready for that. Or a younger guy from a 2024 class might have jumped them. This is, again, it's a good problem to have. I think natural attrition happens at the best programs that you see across the country. Georgia lost, what, 15 or 18 guys at the mid-year to to the portal uh, by themselves. So uh, it's one of those things that because there's so much talent coming in, not only from the portal, but from this recruiting class, you know, if you get bumped, that's just – the world of college football now, especially here at Texas, where, uh, you know, you got to, you know, eat to stay alive or otherwise you uh, you drown, you know. Yep, I got you. All right. Hey, let's keep going here. Got some more questions uh, from people. I'm going to put this up here. It looks like we had a Michigan fan. Stop I, I want to tell him to bring all the Michigan fans in. Let's have a great discussion. I will hear his last name happens to be Austin, by the way. There's some humor in that, I think, uh, or at least some irony. See you guys in September, Les Austin says, when your QB will be running for his life because of our defense. Uh, Look, I I am the first person to admit Michigan's Michigan's (laughs) defense was outstanding in 2023. You lose quite a bit of those guys. Now you still have uh, Grant and Graham coming back, at least for right now. Other guys like Will Johnson as well. Um, But you are behind other teams as it relates to NIL. And so that's one of the reasons why apparently Michigan tried to make a move uh, earlier this week about creating a GM role for NIL, specifically for that reason. We'll see if it's too little too late, though, Les Austin Jr. uh, in that conversation. I think with Michigan, what's going to be interesting to watch for me is I I think it's for in terms of we talk about how Sark has, has done a great job with player development. I think we could argue Michigan may have done the best job the last five years and scouting for sure. Scouting development was top notch, but let's just talk about player development. Um, Look, guys like Pierce, the young D lineman who Texas tried to get in late out of Chicago area, he's going to be tremendous for them. I I think we're going to see a Michigan team that has a lot of talent, 
that's been developed that was evaluated well at the high school level uh, that's been developed. I, I, I just think if you look at this Michigan team, that's kind of was the calling card almost for me outside of Connor Stallions with Jim Harbaugh is uh, that they've done a great job evaluating and developing players. So Michigan's not going away. Uh, for Les Austin Jr., I think the one thing, it's it reminds me of the Alabama game last year in a lot of ways. You're playing Michigan early. Better to play Michigan early than late next year, especially with a head coaching change and all the turnover in the staff. And you're going to have a, a first-time starting quarterback unless you go portal this spring. So it's a new quarterback. Even if it's a portal quarterback, it's a new quarterback in a new university in game two. Um, and so you're going to – Texas is catching them at the best time early in the season. And I don't think Michigan can – the defense is going to have to get it done because Michigan's not going to be able to overwhelm you with offensive talent. And when you go on the road against a really good team, uh, and that's what why I thought Texas and Bama last year, Texas had a great shot against Bama, is Alabama couldn't overwhelm you offensively when you went into their house like they could with some of those past teams. I think it's going to be similar with Michigan. It'll be a fun game, and it's going to be a lot of buildup and hype. It, it's actually uh, rather remarkable how much Michigan put into the NFL a year ago. I have the list here of guys that departed from last year's team. Starting quarterback, leading rusher, leading wide receiver, number three wide receiver, starting left tackle, starting left guard, starting center, starting right guard, starting right tackle. The and entire the offensive line departed, not to mention the starting right guard before the year who yeah. went down with an injury midway through the season. Leading tackler at linebacker, starting defensive tackle, two edge guys, uh, your will, a cornerback, and a nickel. So a lot of pieces, not to mention a starting safety just went down with an injury in spring ball. Uh, a, earlier this week, I believe. Yeah. So uh, a, a brand new looking team, really, not to mention the turnover at coaching staff as well. Uh, although development, again, as we've talked about, has been the key for Michigan, a brand new team from what they put on the field in terms of their starting 22 a year ago. My Even though Jerome Moore is an offensive coach, my guess is that they're de he's not wrong about their defense. Their defense will yeah. be ahead of their offense. Yeah. They're re replacing the entire starting offensive line and their quarterback, leading rusher, leading receiver, they'll they'll be they they are questionable on offense heading into 2024. A, a real Michigan fan would actually admit that. Now, or at least a a, a quasi reasonable one, which sometimes there are a few of those. The the piece on defense, do they have dudes on defense that are going to be first round picks? Yeah, they may have three or four. So I'm not. No one would say. They're not going to make their plays, uh, but to act like they're going to just dominate, I think, is a little rich uh, for that discussion uh, at this point. All right. Uh, hey, guys, let's turn away from actual from Michigan to an actual real rivalry. Um, uh, Michael Alvarado says, I'm so ready to play A&M. My in-laws are all A&M alums fans, and they won't stop talking smack. <laughs> I, I got to agree with them. They won't talk, stop talking smack. I've heard some uh, from some as well. Uh, guys, uh, where, where are we at with Mike Elko? Year one, what do we expect from him? Just like we just talked a little bit about Sharon Moore in Michigan in his year one. Is he that much different than Michigan uh, in year one at, at a and I, I think the key is quarterback health for a and with Wiegman, right? And, and offensive line, that offensive line has to improve in a hurry. At AM. I think that's going to be huge for the Aggies next year. Um, is how much how much improvement on the offensive line are you at not talked about, but are you actually going to see? Um, they have to knock it out of the park in 2025 recruiting on the offensive line, by the way. They have to. Uh, I think defensively they're gonna have good parts. It's almost like they're having a tryout on defense this spring. They took a lot of guys in the portal. Um, and it's smart with a first time for a new head coach, by the way. I think they're going to be good on defensive line. I think Edger and Cooper is the biggest loss for them on defense, as crazy as that sounds. I think that guy was a tremendous linebacker. Um, you know, so what's the what's the running back rotation? What's the depth going to look like at AM and uh, at the beginning of next year? I, I really think that's the key. And, and I'll say this, um, you know, it, it, Coach Elko, right out of the gate, he's got Notre Dame. I mean, so – that right out of the gate, you got Notre Dame to start at a and and uh, that could be a tickle me Elko moment if they win. <laughs> what do you got, CJ? 
I, I think it, uh, off the field, I think Elko is doing a fine job of getting kids to campus. You know, that's one of uh, the luxuries of Texas A&M, obviously, for the last decade has been the SEC patch on the chest is you now able, able to recruit at a different level. And while AM and m has never, never struggled to get guys on campus and eventually in the class, uh, it's a little bit of a different, you know, kind of theme that we're hearing out of Texas A&M at the moment. Uh, relationships are starting to be built, and, you know, they're good ones for that matter. Uh, I think Elko is going to be a little bit more personable than what you saw with Jimbo Fisher. That staff, obviously, after seeing what happened with the previous regime, is going to take note of how important it is for these guys to come play for them and the university rather than whatever incentives uh, were promised or given at the time, uh, like they saw a couple of years ago. But uh, so far, good, good. They, they've done well out of College Station right now in recruiting, and they're going to be a, th- a thorn moving forward. I, I can hey, say, I, and I also will say this. I also will say this. Elko is much more proven as a head coach than Sharon Moore. I mean, look, Elko took Duke. He's only been a head coach for two years, did a nice job uh, with the Blue Devils. Now, granted, he had a really good quarterback to do that with. It has now transferred to Notre Dame. Hey, uh, Jerry, let me ask you this. Yeah. David Rawls, does Colin Klein, the new OC over at AM, you think he's going to run Wegman into more injuries? He sure does like uh, – he likes running the quarterback, though, dude. That, yeah. he, doesn't, he doesn't play without doing that. Yeah, I don't think I don't think they'll do that um, because I think they know how important Weigman is uh, to their season. Uh, so I don't think they'll. I, I don't think you're going to see that. Um, by the way, I want to say one thing is the biggest thing that had to change when Elko was hired was the demands on the players. And I was I've been told multiple times that yeah, I mean the days of being late for uh, off season conditioning or missing off season conditioning work out there are over. They, there's been multiple guys that have been threatened that you're going home if you're late again. You're out of here. So that biggest change that needed to happen for a and is happening. All good. All right, Doug, I want to say thanks uh, one last time to one of our sponsors. That's uh, Andy Ludicky at MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you want to own your own business, uh, franchising may be the right option for you. And there's only one person to contact if that's the case, because he can tell you about all of them and actually try to match you with the best fit for yourself. That's Andy Ludicky. He's done it with dozens of people uh, professionally for a long period of time. Give him a call, 404-973-9901, or visit his website, myperfectfranchise.net, to learn more, or email him, Andy, at myperfectfranchise.net. I've known Andy almost for 30 years now, good guy. Uh, Went to school with his sister at the University of Texas, by the way. That's how long I've known Andy. All right, uh, again, that's myperfectfranchise.net. We talked about AM. We talked a little bit about Michigan. Let's go to OU for a second. This one from Randy D. Jones. Dylan Gabriel leaving OU hurt badly. Oregon's reloading again, but let's stick to the OU part of this question. CJ, I know that you talk, you look a, a lot about OU and uh, have followed them uh, hard for uh, a number of years. What do you see with the Sooners this year? Well, their strength is going to be on the defensive side of the ball. You know, you get your pieces back a year ago that made a lot of noise, Billy Bowman, Danny Stutzman, uh, the guys that kind of were your faces of the program a year ago are returning. I think they have some nice pieces on the defensive line as well with Adam Aware, uh, Ethan Downs, a couple guys that could give Texas problems off the edge. But that offense, I think, is going to take some time to get up to speed, and it's because they have to replace a brand-new offensive line. I, I'm not so much worried about Jackson Arnold. I, I, I think he'll be a fine piece, but that offensive line could certainly stunt the growth of him as a, uh, in terms of a quarterback development. Uh, where they are in the plus side of things is their wide receivers. I think their wide receiver, of course, uh, amongst the best in the SEC. You could argue – you know, it's one of the top five, top ten in the entire country as well. When you add Deion Birch to a group of Andrew Anthony and Nick Anderson, uh, Jalil Farouk as well. So, I mean, it's it's a really healthy group for Jackson Arnold to be throwing to. The issue is, can you trust the group in front of him? Three guys departed to the NFL, a couple other portaled. Uh, you're looking at a brand new group who never played together, never played in the system, all of which transferred in. And one guy went down in practice uh, two days ago, uh, Troy Everett, out of the portal came in and was a starting guy right away. So uh, that's going to be the big question mark is whether or not they can protect similarly to AM. Otherwise, you know, things could get 
a little sticky up there for the, the Sooner offense. Uh, uh, no no one's it. worried about it being sticky. Everybody would be happy with that on this uh, <laughs> this uh, chat. What are, what are you saying, Jerry? Uh, let's think about So Jackson Arnold was a one-read guy coming out of high school. Uh, you know, if you one of the teams that beat him, uh, it, they, they were like, if they took away the first read, they said, okay, he had a long way to go uh, as a quarterback. So it'll be interesting to see where he's at this year. Uh, the other thing is, look, where does – the, the thing with Oklahoma, by the way, I think Jackson Arnold has the most pressure on him of any quarterback in the SEC. And I'm not trying to add to his pressure. I'm just going to call it like I see it. And some people would say, no, it's Quinn Ewers, it's Carson Beck, uh, it's Jackson Dart because they're ranked high. I, I don't see it that way. I, I see Jackson Arnold. When you let Dylan Gabriel walk and you're moving to the SEC and you're a first-year starting quarterback and you're at Oklahoma with the expectations in Venables year three, you have a lot of pressure. To perform, And if you look at the SEC, where is Oklahoma going to stack up at quarterback depending on his play this year? I mean, there's a lot more experienced quarterbacks in the SEC uh, than he is going to be, than Jackson Arnold's going to be this year. I mean, look, Quinn's going to be year three, right? Jackson Dart's going to be year three. Milrow's going to be year two. I mean, you just kind of go down the list of quarterbacks in the SEC. Um, and, and where's Jackson Arnold kind of where is that going to be? I mean, you got Nico, who started one game, right? LSU is going to have Nussmeyer, who's played a little bit. Wiegman has more experience if he's healthy. But where, is he, where are you going to kind of fall as far as that experience goes? And he's got a lot of pressure on him this year. I agree. I, I just I think that OU in general has a lot of pressure on him because they could have used another year in, in the Big 12 Yeah, to, to get healthy a little bit, but especially with the five – incoming new offensive lineman. I mean, let's that is not a recipe for success, right? That is not a recipe for success overall. All right, uh, I want to say thank you to our sponsors today, MyPerfectFranchise.net, uh, Andy Ludicky and his group uh, over there helping people start their own businesses. Autograph, the app, uh, make sure you check it out. Uh, started by the GOAT, Tom Brady. Uh, you can get uh, discounted tickets and more, as well as increase your uh, getting rewarded for your fandom at Autograph. And then, obviously, Flat Creek Winery, the award-winning winery right there uh, in the Austin, Texas area. Uh, they've got the specials going on right now. If you go out to their winery, uh, they've got the, the Eclipse coming up. They've got hundreds of people scheduled to go there for that, as well as big plans for Easter. And you can also get their wines at Specs as well. Uh, 11 medals in 30 days for those guys. Uh, congratulations to them. All right. Uh, for Jerry Hamilton and CJ Vogel, I'm Bobby Burton. That's been this episode of the Friday afternoon live stream. Please join us again. Uh, we do it all again next week uh, for CJ and Jerry. Hook them.